Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Good morning. Uh, let us now continue with uh, the current session or class, which will be actually be on uh, a historical overview of Parsi theatre. But before that, let me just briefly summarize what we discussed in the previous class. So, in the previous class, we um, looked at how um, a lot of uh, early modern Indian theatre, right, even before it was actually self-consciously called or known as modern, uh, drew a lot from, uh, was modeled against Sanskrit theater. Right? And this was, uh, of course, due to, due to the emergence of um, Orientalism and Indology as um, colonial uh, philological disciplines, right? which were actually interested in uh, reconstructing a glorious, uninterrupted um, ancient Hindu past. Right? So a lot of uh, early, um, uh, Indian theatre, early modern Indian theatre, was modelled against Sanskrit theatre. What then came to be called as so-called uh, Hindu theatre was modelled against Sanskrit theatre. Right? And uh, we saw this in, let's say, the earliest histories of Indian theatre, uh, including uh, Horace Heyman Wilson's uh, three-volume Select Specimens of the Theatre of the Hindus, published in 1827 in Calcutta, and Sylvan, Sylvan Levy's two-volume The Indian Theatre which were clearly influenced by Orientalism in that they equated Indian theatre with Sanskrit theatre while completely dismissing, overlooking the fact that Indian theatre was actually a very multilingual uh, form of performance. Uh, so whether it was Sanskrit plays or non-Sanskrit plays, there were the presence of other Indian languages which had been completely overlooked and erased in the process of trying to produce a colonial reconstruction of uh, modern Indian theatre. So, what is now known as modern Indian theatre finds its beginning somewhere in the late 18th century and carries on to the present. So, this modelling of Sanskrit theatre, of modern Indian theatre on Sanskrit theatre, uh, drew from, of course, Bharataj's ancient uh, dramaturgical treatise called the Nati Shastra, which was a very prescriptive text that provided copious data on theoretical and practical aspects of theatre, from acting and dancing to music and prosody, the, sides, the sizes and shapes of playhouses, costumes and makeup, theories of emotions and sentiments, requirements for critics and audiences and so on. It was Kalidasa, the, the Sanskrit playwright, Kalidasa's Abhijnan Shakuntalam, which was translated by William Jones and published in Calcutta in 1789, which along with, of course, uh, Shudrakas Mrishikatika, which formed the uh, models uh, of uh, Sanskrit aesthetics, which then came to be emulated uh, or imitated by uh, many other playwrights, both before and after independence. And uh, in the process of translating and disseminating these, these texts, um, uh, the fact that there were many other languages that were spoken by women, uh, the, subor the subordinate male characters of the play, like Shauri Saini, Maharashtri and Magadhi, were completely forgotten and uh, overlooked. Right. Uh, we also uh, briefly mentioned that there were several folk performative traditions, many of which were traveling itinerant traditions of theatre in pre-colonial India, where theatre overlapped with dance and music. Right. But again, many of these traditions were overlooked or dismissed by colonial scholars uh, uh, as crude and low forms of performance art in the process of trying to produce a colonial idea or notion of what Indian theatre should be. Right. Uh, colonial era theatre drew on Western conventions of theatre in terms of lighting and scenography while shunning these local theatrical forms as crude. Right. 
and there was again a turn back, as I mentioned earlier, to pre-modern Sanskritic models of theatre, which came to be re revalued as classical because of nationalist aspirations. So there was an attempt by na the nationalist elite to uh, create a form of theatre which drew from pre-modern Sanskritic traditions of performance and at the same time trying to actually address rather modern contemporary uh, issues that concerned the nation to be. I mean, of course, this included a whole host of issues like widow remarriage, sati, um, you know, female education, uh, and so on and so forth. Right? Um, later, even later histories of Indian theatre, like Hemendranath Das Gupta's four-volumed Indian stage, which was published in Calcutta in the mid uh, 19th century, just before independence, and Ram Lal, Raman Lal, Kanaya Lal Yagnik's The Indian Theatre did not actually acknowledge the presence of other theatre performance traditions in India. Many of the later histories of Indian theatre written after independence again continue to emphasise the lasting importance of Sanskrit theatre on Indian theatre. And many of uh, these actors who actually acted in these early uh, plays did not have a sense of what these western forms of theatre were. Um, and they naturally, of course, incorporated many folk techniques into their performance despite the growing modernization of Indian theatre. It was under the rule of the East India Company when uh, the early playhouses were set up in Calcutta. In 1775 was Calcutta Theatre, the Chauringe Theatre in 1813, the Sans Souci Theatre in 1839, and so on, which were actually patronized by colonial officials. Um, the colonial idea of theatre, and this come, becomes very important in the, even in the case of Parsi theatre. Uh, the colonial idea of theatre was understood as an enclosed space with a raised proscenium stage between rows of seats. It made theatre a spectacle to be watched by the audience who are at the same time, who are at the same or at a higher level than the stage. Now this is important to actually note because it's in the proscenium arch under the, or within the proscenium, proscenium arch that you have uh, a reproduction of uh, scenery, scenery, scenography. You have a backdrop and you have a front, front drop. You have actors who are standing in front of a backdrop um, and it's, it takes the form of a framed picture which again uh, addresses uh, or uh, gestures towards the multiple possibilities of uh, perspectivalism, the kinds of perspectives that a spectator can have when a play is being performed in an enclosed space on a raised platform. Uh, and colonial theatre in its initial beginnings was uh, patronised and frequented by the colonial western and Indian elite, particularly the Parsis of Bombay who were uh, very important, crucial traders, bankers and philanthropists. And it was only in the late 19th century that theatre actually spread as a form of mass entertainment in Calcutta, Bombay and Madras to schools and colleges when it became a commercial ticketed event and there was a new distinction between the actor manager and the director. Right? Uh, now let us just go into and you know let's briefly also discuss uh, what Parsi theatre was exactly. Let us, let's provide you with a historical overview of Parsi theatre. Now, I will be quoting in this session um, largely from certain important uh, scholars of theatre like uh, Catherine Hansen and Anuradha Kapoor um, who have been very crucial in trying to historicize and conceptualize Parsi theatre precisely because it is a, a form of theatre which um, presents many challenges. There are many challenges to the conceptualization and methodology of Parsi theatre. Okay. Now firstly, it's important to not identify or associate the Parsi community with Parsi theatre entirely. The Parsis who were the followers of the prophet Zarastra right, and they immigrated from Iran to Gujarat over a thousand years ago, right, settled in Bombay in the 18th century. Right. And many of these prominent Parsi families made fortunes as bankers and traders. Their social interaction with colonial elites, right, um, exposure to English language theatre and entrepreneurial skill included, uh, inclined uh, Parsis to organise the first modern 
theatrical companies in South Asia. What is also important to note is that although the companies remained under Parsi management well into the 20th century, actors and actresses were increasingly drawn from the ranks of Muslims, Hindus, Anglo-Indians and Baghdadi Jews. They were professional writers, musicians, painters and other creative personnel who were often non-Parsis. Parsi theatrical performances only occasionally referred to Parsi religion or culture. And this is a study of Parsi theatre from Catherine Hansen's essay, Languages on Stage, Linguistic Pluralism and Community Formation in the 19th Century Parsi Theatre. So it's important to realise or note that in terms of audience, the Parsi theatre's appeal extended far beyond the Parsi community in the course of its near century of development. And an additional challenge to uh, studying Parsi theatre, Hansen argues, is the fact that it's spread across a wide range of languages. Parsi drama was written and produced in Gujarati, Urdu and English. And the, while the literature in Urdu, uh, much of the secondary literature on Parsi theatre in Urdu favours Muslim playwrights and assimilates non-Muslims to the rubric of Urdu theatre, whereas the corresponding body of writing in Gujarati and Hindi ignores the Muslim contributions or subsumes it within the nationalist ideology that equates Hindustan and Hindustani with Hindi and Hindu. So, one can read about Parsi Gujarati theatre, the Parsi Urdu theatre and the Parsi Hindi theatre in literary histories but rarely gets a sense of the whole, is what uh, Catherine, Han Catherine Hansen argues, that there was a significant presence of the Parsi theatre in locations such as Calcutta and Madras. Uh, in, uh, so the significant presence of Parsi theatre in locations such as Calcutta and Madras were absent whereas there were a lot more uh, significant and, and conspicuous in Bombay as well as uh, locations outside India, including Ceylon and Burma. So, uh, Parsi theatre refers only or primarily to the Parsi uh, entrepreneurship, the management of theatre companies by elite Parsis, right? and not so much to the content or the form of these plays. Right? Uh, or even in terms of the actors and the crew members who made up the uh, uh, theatre production house. So it's important to then think of Parsi theatre as a category, as a form of, of theatre that crosses linguistic lines, right, which are now firmly drawn or established across South Asian literary scholarship. So. Although the Parsi theatre was produced within a cosmopolitan entertainment economy at a time when linguistic and communal identities, identities were fluid and overlapping, contemporary understanding of the phenomenon has arisen under the shadow of the subcontinent's religious and ethnic ant antagonisms. Right? So it's important to then uh, remember, remember that Parsi theatre had a pluralist polyglot nature. It was composed of multiple languages, ethnicities, religions, right, in terms of the actors, the crew members, the language in which the play was performed. And it is not what uh, has now become uh, rigidly demarcated uh, linguistic zones uh, of culture and, uh, and literary and performance production. Uh, we see the heydays, the peak of Parsi theatre from 1853 to let's say the early decades of the 20th century. Uh, so the early amateur Parsi theatre clubs and professional companies in Bombay made use of English, Gujarati and Urdu for their productions. Many of the prefaces of these plays were written in Gujarati or Urdu and contained a lot of information about the playwright's choice of language and relationship to their public. And it's also important to remember that um, Parsi theatre as it, as it emerged as a multilingual phenomenon right, uh, did not in some sense um, argue for uh, the standardization or the purity of any one particular language. Right? Uh, there was an instability of standard or accepted forms of literary language uh, 
there was the divergence of prose and poetry and the perception that they demanded distinct idioms was completely erased or blurred. And there's also fluctuation in regard to the choice of script. Right? In fact, many of the prefaces to these plays uh, uh, mentioned uh, or discussed the playwright's choice of a particular language and its reception uh, and the situation under which the play was being performed, uh, produced and performed. So, um, it's, so for example, um, initially there were uh, Parsi plays being performed in English, but then by the middle decades of the 19th century, English was sidelined and the primary rivalry then began to occur between uh, Gujarati and Urdu plays. There were several Urdu plays, Parsi plays that were written in the Gujarati script. And um, uh, this, of course, suggested that the actors, uh, the, the, the playwright, uh, may not have had literacy in Urdu, even at a time when Urdu was uh, uh, being spoken uh, within certain elite cir circles. Right? But these were uh, Urdu plays written in the Gujarati script. In the, so initially you had the uh, establishment of the uh, Grant Road Theatre in the 1870s and 80s in Bombay, which initially uh, uh, produced English language Parsi plays. And then there was an extension of the Grant Road Theatre in uh, more enlarged playhouses like Gaiety and Novelty near the Victoria Railway Terminus. Um, established theatre companies like Elphinstone, Victoria and Alfred, uh, which were initially involved in rather amateur uh, dramatics. Uh, became increasingly profitable for their Parsi owners. They began staging by uh, professional actor managers, right? became lavish uh, as scenery, costumes and musical style were coordinated for spectacular effects. And it's in this time of efflorescence that theatrical companies undertook the regular commissioning of dramas for performance. And the texts of these commissioned players were published under the company's name in book form. Right. So it's important to see how theatre was being institutionalised during this period when plays were being written and transcribed and printed in the form of books and uh, disseminated. Some of the early notables, many of whom were Parsis, like uh, Balkras Nath Sankarset or uh, Jamshed Gigi Boy, uh, Jagannath Shankarset and Frame G. Kawasji were uh, some of the early uh, Parsi and non-Parsi notables and philanthropists, many of whom are also traders and bankers, who collected subscriptions and petitioned the governor of Bombay for a new theatre. So the Grant Road Theatre, which was founded by these notables, was opened in 1846 on land donated by Shankar Seth with a generous contribution from G. G. Uh, Indian financial and civic leaders, through these acts, embraced theatre as an object of cultural philanthropy and demonstrated their status and taste laying the foundation for much broader participation by the Bombay populace in years to come. Until 1853, all the performances in the Grand Road Theatre were in English. Uh, the performers of English theatre included both amateur British actors residing in the cantonment and civil lines and professional touring artists from England, Europe and America. Um, and then uh, 1853 also saw uh, the first Parsi theatrical uh, uh, company plays like Rustum, Zabuli and Saurabh, which is produced in Gujarati. And um, it's only after the waning of English theatre that you had the emergence of uh, Gujarati uh, and Urdu language plays. What's also important to note that, uh, is that a lot of these plays in Gujarati also drew a lot from folk uh, performative traditions like Bhavai and Yakshagana rather than merely or purely Western methods. But the Grand Road Theatre was located in the native, in the fort area of Bombay, in the native, uh, so called the native part of town, and that made it difficult for a lot of uh, British uh, English audiences to actually watch the play, uh, the plays. But in fact, for that very reason, Grand Road Theatre then became uh, 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 open primarily accessible, accessed primarily by Indian audiences.
and the Grand Road Theatre advertised precise times for ticket sales, seating, starting and finishing the show. There were new structures of capital right, that reconfigured the theatre as an economic institution and the introduction of joint stock companies and the marketing of tickets as opposed to patronage by local elites. So what one, one saw initially before the emergence of Parsi theatre in a big way was the fact that there were these uh, British uh, sponsored notch performances uh, by um, uh, feudal elites. Right? And this was then replaced by a new commercial, a commercialized, uh, institutionalized form of theatre uh, in the form of the Grand Road Theatre initially. Uh, through the introduction of joint stock companies and marketing of tickets and also the emergence of the director as opposed to the uh, actor manager. Right. Uh, so in its earlier year, earliest years, Parsi Theatre developed a, a pension for producing plays based on Shakespeare. So according to the newspapers, Parsi Theatre productions of Taming of the Shrew, The Merchant of Venice, Two Gentlemen of Verona and Timon of, of Eth Athens uh, which were all, of course, translated into Gujarati, were performed in the Grant Road Theatre between 1857 and 1859. Even uh, some of the other uh, sites for performance, uh, especially Elphinstone College, right, uh, became a fairly anglicized uh, space for theatre performances. Uh, there were a large number of English plays, the Grant Road Theatre, but there were also many other plays, Shakespeare's plays being performed by the Shakespeare Society, um, who were largely uh, students of English literature and drama from uh, Elphinstone College. And so there was initially at least this impulse to try and translate and enact Shakespeare in English uh, to adapting Shakespeare in Indian languages and its environments. So the Grand Road Theatre in its initial uh, days aligned itself both with the English educated elite and the Gujarati and Urdu speakers of several classes and the theatre advanced its prestige and profitability uh, uh, while ensuring that its public need not struggle with a foreign tongue. So there was an attempt to try and bridge the gap between uh, English, English language plays and uh, local languages like uh, Gujarati. Now, when, with the emergence of Gujarati language plays, Parsi theatre in some sense reinvented itself. Uh, there was an attempt by these early Parsi dramatists to uh, resort to English versions of the Shahanama. Uh, this was done as an attempt to try and reconstruct uh, a glorious uh, Parsi past which aligned itself with a mythical uh, history of, uh, of Persia. So therefore, this need to try and uh, trace back one's cultural uh, roots to the Shahnama. And in also uh, identifying Firdausi as the ancient uh, king of the Parsis. Right. So the uh, very well-known uh, and preeminent Gujarati playwright K.K. Um, Kabra, uh, again, um, considered Firdausi as the father of Persian poetry and he kind of uh, acknowledged uh, Firdausi as the source, uh, almost the glorious source of, of Parsi culture and uh, made him one of the major characters uh, in uh, many of his uh, Gujarati Parsi plays. And this is what uh, Kabra has to say in a preface to uh, his book uh, Jamshed. Um, due to the fact that the playwright unfortunately does not know the Persian language, he has not been able to take direct advantage of the poet Firdausi's interesting and effective language. And to compose parts of the play, he has taken a little necessary help from English translations of Rustam and Saurabh by Matthew Arnold, Atkinson and other gentlemen and the first chapter of the Gujarati version of the Barjor Nama and the writings of Mansukh for which we express gratitude. So what's interesting about this is that these Parsis were trying to actually identify themselves as distinct from the growing uh, nationalist movement, which was increasingly becoming or styling itself as Hindu, and uh, also from uh, the British colonial Raj and um, its attempts to try and uh, convert uh, many of uh, many sections of the Indian population to Christianity uh, and to ally themselves with Christian uh, themes and Christian uh, myths. Uh, so here you have. Uh, Parsi 
the Parsi community, which is alienated from its cultural roots and even from, it, from the language it spoke, Farsi, but in the process also trying to uh, reconstruct for that very reason a uh, unique and distinct uh, cultural history by identifying Firdausi as the source of that cultural history and literary history. Um, so the choice of the Shahnama as the source of many Parsi plays, uh, early Parsi plays, should be seen in relation to the so-called Hindu theater, which was establishing itself in Bombay. And of course, the so-called Hindu theater was being seen as the national theater of the Hindus, and it drew a lot from the Ramayana and the Puranas for its own uh, performances. So this aspect, in the sense that uh, this impulse by Parsi uh, playwrights to draw from the Shahnama uh, for its own uh, early performances, um, in some sense also uh, contradicts or undermines the fact or the belief that Parsis were largely uh, British loving and imitated British uh, mannerisms, behavior, clothing and so on. So, uh, it was not as if the Parsis were merely Anglophilic, British loving, colonial uh, loving, had merely had uh, commercial and financial links with the colonial state uh, or merely assimilated European cultural traits, but was also trying to, in some sense, create its or recreate its own cultural past. So Parsi theatre appropriated many techniques of Victorian stagecraft and fed off the imperial image of the Raj. What is overlooked is that there was a certain vocal sector, a very vocal sector of the community, which responded to challenges of modernity by using drama for the revival of vernacular traditions. Right? In engaging with their history, they identified with Iran, Gujarat and India rather than the West. Demarcation of the community's boundaries by these practitioners served as an instrument for the ideological work of resisting colonial hegemony and upholding cultural distinctiveness. Now, so as I mentioned earlier, the Parsis were in some sense felt the need to position themselves uh, as uh, uneasily between the uh, growing uh, uh, heat of the nationalist Hindu movement uh, and the uh, Christian colonial power on the other hand. And I also mentioned earlier that many of these Parsi uh, plays drew a lot from local folk dramatic forms for like Bhavai, the Lavanese and the ballads in Gujarati and Marathi, which were associated with Malharis and Tamasha, other folk forms, as well as ghazals in Persian, Urdu and Gujarati, songs based on Bhakti poets like Kabir and Horis, Thumris, Tappas and other secular songs. And the content of these volumes, uh, of these plays, uh, which included all these uh, local folk forms, suggested a very composite oral culture that was now being circulated in print and made accessible to an urban audience. And this, in some sense, contributed to the institutionalization of uh, uh, Indian theatre, modern Indian theatre. The advent of Urdu is another important aspect of Parsi theatre. Uh, especially because the acceptance of Urdu as a language of the stage was uh, in some sense uh, an attempt to try and enrich its own theatrical performances by drawing on the, uh, the high status art forms that were associated with Urdu and Farsi. Some of the most highly uh, educated Parsis attached to early theatre like Dada Bhai Sohrabji Patel or Dadi Patel M.A. as he was popularly known was uh, the first person to actually receive a Master's of Arts degree from the University of Bombay. And he was the, one of the early pioneers to push Parsh theatre towards adopting Urdu uh, and as a language of performance uh, and drama. And he was the one who actually popularized opera as a new form. He introduced uh, scientific stagecraft, again a quotation from Catherine Hansen's essay. He professionalized the company by offering full-time salaries and began the practice of touring even before railway lines were completed to the Deccan. Right? So you can imagine what an important presence uh, Dadi Patel had 
on early Parsi drama. Uh, many of the early uh, actors in uh, Parsi theatre were young boys, Parsi boys, who played both male as well as female roles, but largely female roles. Uh, and they attended madrasas where they studied Persian and Arabic. Uh, this is of course for their own performances. Um, so the acquisition of Persian and the revival of historical ties to Iran uh, in some sense may have, uh, Catherine Hansen argues, uh, fostered feelings for Urdu. So even though the, the knowledge of Urdu was lacking among playwrights, actors and spectators um, when the language was first produced on stage, there was still an attempt to try and uh, embrace Urdu as a language of performance uh, and also the fact that Urdu and, more, and probably more uh, largely speaking, uh, more importantly speaking, uh, Persian um, had access to other traditions of, uh, of, um, of art, of music and dance. Uh, which are very important in enriching uh, Parsi theatre. There were two claims that were made for the introduction of Urdu. First, Urdu was seen as the overarching language beyond specific communities, thereby extending the audience for Parsi theatre. Second, Urdu was thought to connect the theatre to rich narrative and lyric traditions, enhancing its literary, literary stature and pleasurability. What seemed unimportant to the writer was any association that Hindustani or Urdu might have to a specific group of speakers. It was rather the absence of territorial boundaries, its detachment from limiting notions of community that recommended Urdu as a theatrical medium. And as I mentioned earlier, there was a whole generation of Urdu dramas for the Parsi theatre which were being printed in Gujarati script. The Arabic script only began to be used for printed Urdu decades, a decade later, right, in the 1860s and 70s. There was also an intense rivalry between the two leading companies, theatre companies of the early 1870s, the Victoria Theatrical Company and the Elphinstone Company. In fact, there was a, great, a very strong rivalry between them over the production of Urdu plays. So there was, uh, for example, uh, Kumar, Kumarji Nazir's uh, a production of Sone Ke Mol Ki Khurshid, the first Urdu play, Sone Ke Mol Ki Khurshid, um, uh, which was performed by both the theatrical companies. There was Noor Jahan, translated into Urdu by Aram, another important uh, playwright and translator. And uh, there was Benazir Badre Munir, produced in 1872. There was also a translation of Khori's Hatim Tai, which was produced in 18, which was, which was, which again, where, where Dadi Patel himself starred in the lead to create a claim. Then there was Aram's second opera, Jahangir Shah or Gohar. Um, and of course, the most important, uh, Indar Sabha, which is again a very important Urdu play, which in some sense established the very tradi uh, tradition of uh, modern playwriting and performance in Urdu. And this was performed as an opera with special lighting and musical effects at the Elphinstone Company. So there was, Urdu was given the, a certain importance because it was seen as a, a, a language of aesthetics in terms of poetry and song, but it was also seen as a link language that linked many other theatrical traditions together. Many of the early uh, Urdu poets, school teachers and men of letters saw in Parsi theatre an opportunity to benefit the earnings and approach the companies themselves. Of, of key significance is courtly employment, which was always precarious, but even more so after the events of 1857, the poets and entertainers found a welcome source of income in the Parsi companies. Right? So the Parsi companies were a, mu a, a big source of income for the uh, Urdu poets, school teachers and men of letters who were interested in acting as well as scripting these early Urdu plays. And as I mentioned earlier, the Indra Sabha, Right, uh, an important play by Aga Hassan Amanat of Lucknow, which was performed in 1853, again was very important in uh, trying to define and establish a new tradition of uh, Urdu playwriting. And of course, by 1890, uh, many of these uh, Parsi theatre plays were being printed in Arabic script from Agra, Meerat, Kanpur, Delhi and Fatehpur. They were being performed by all the important theatrical companies, including Victoria Theatrical Company, uh, the uh, Alfred uh, Company, as well as the Elphinstone Company. So to um, continue with uh, 
our discussion, right? It's the, it was the it was actually Aga Hassan Amanat's uh, Urdu play in the Sabha, which was performed in Lucknow around 1853, which actually set off a virtual landslide of theatrical performances across Uttar Pradesh, reaching as far as Lahore and Dhaka. There was a, a practice of writing for theatrical performances in Urdu right, even earlier, but it was not entirely synonymous with playwriting as it was evolving in Bombay because a play by definition now had come to be something that was divided into acts and scenes. Right? So this whole idea of dividing a, a play into acts and scenes was clearly a uh, Western uh, introduction, formal introduction into uh, playwriting. So even some of the later Urdu plays, which were written um, by uh, Muslim playwrights, uh, were in some sense using Urdu uh, to its advantage right? because uh, the choice of Urdu uh, was not uh, merely restricted to those who were erudite and, and, and uh, elite. Right? There was in fact uh, also an understanding that Urdu could be used, could be expanded to, uh, to uh, include more than just a language or a community but an entire vocabulary of pleasure which was not limited by any territorial boundary. So that was in some sense the importance of uh, Urdu in uh, Parsi theatre uh, because it was a link language which went beyond caste, community and territory and it was also important in terms of um, um, providing access to new vocabularies of pleasure and aesthetics in terms of songs and dances and poetry. Now to go to the next point, uh, it's, it's very important to remember that all the early actors in Parsi theatre were men and it were, it were basically, there were basically boys, young boys whose voices probably had not cracked right, in the ages of 10, 11, 12, 13 who performed these female roles. Now, it is true to a certain extent that uh, um, women were forbidden from acting on stage. There was a lot of stigma attached to the performance of women on stage, precisely because once women were made visible on stage, they were uh, seen to be uh, of loose, disreputable character. Right? But it is also important to uh, contextualize the entire question of young boys or men performing female roles uh, in the larger context of uh, uh, making certain notions of femininity and womanhood visible on stage. So it wasn't just a question of trying to invisibilize women on stage, not make them accessible to the male gaze, but at the same time to be able to perform femininity on stage through young boys, many of whom were trained uh, in uh, to actually uh, emulate women and not just any kind of women but uh, a certain ideal notion of womanhood. So if on the one hand you had young boys or men uh, performing womanhood being female impersonators. On the other hand, this was also complemented by the presence of Anglo-Indian and Jewish actresses on stage, many of whom masqueraded as Hindu and Parsi heroines, especially at a time when Hindu women were not allowed to perform on stage without being stigmatized. So one needs to locate um, female impersonation uh, within a larger widely circulated standard of what constituted femininity, female appearance and a very modified code of feminine conduct. Right? So it's not just the notion that impersonators and outsider actresses served as expedient surrogates when the presence of Indian actresses on stage 
would have endangered the urban theater's reputation. But that now you had masquerades of gender and race. Remember, you're talking about young boys or men performing women, right? Performing a certain ideal notion of womanhood. But also questions of race, because you had Anglo Indian and Jewish actresses who were trying to pass off. In fact, they also took on or adopted uh, Hindu names and were passing off as Indian women, even if they appeared to be uh, fair skinned and uh, possessing modern ways of behaving and being. So you had masquerades of gender and race, which were now productive of new ways of looking upon the female form. So practices of gender and race impersonation, again, this is from Catherine Has Hansen's essay, making women visible, gender and race cross-dressing in the Parsi theater, uh, where she argues that practices of gender and race impersonation enlarged the performative possibilities within which theater managers, dramatists, and publics would experiment with the unfamiliar procedures of imagining and viewing women. With the rise of the middle class theater going public and the increasing size of the female audience. Now remember along the decades of the latter decades of the 19th century, you had uh, even women being allowed into theater spaces. Right? So you had, um, uh, you had to in some sense address the spectator as a gendered subject. So how do you perform femininity and womanhood to a gendered subject? How do you provide and offer uh, new ways of seeing and looking uh, and representing? Right. So not only were male viewers catered to in more complex ways, as the long-standing culture of homosociality was contested by notions of companionate marriage. Right. But women were more and more a greater presence in the audience, and it was their presence which required accommodation within the theater house and whose desires and enjoyment influenced the enactment of gender difference. Right. So for both men and women, performances of feminine identity opened up an arena in which gender norms could be articulated and debated. So theatrical cross-dressing in this period of the 1860s and 70s went beyond the reification of existing gender boundaries or the transgression of those boundaries um, for the purpose of generating laughter. Right. So it's not just, so the whole idea of cross-dressing, of, of, of being a transvestite on stage, uh, was not just to transgress the boundaries of gender or to generate laughter, but to actually provide the audience with a visual construct of ideal womanhood, uh, and which was an image of bourgeois respectability. So the regulation of the external look of women through the emphasis on fashion and feminine accoutrements was a key ingredient in this semiotic makeover. So a lot of keen attention was paid to the ways in which these men or boys dressed up, uh, the fashion, uh, their sartorial fashions, their clothes, their behavior, and so on. And uh, what's also interesting is the fact that many women who watch these plays uh, try to emulate or imitate these men who performed femininity, an ideal femininity on stage. So there was an attempt to subsume the overt sexuality of the traditional female impersonator or courtesan performer within norms of modesty. And cross dress performers, together with playwrights and directors, crafted a new interiority. Right? So what was the, the new interiority of the, of the man who performed the woman on stage, which was to identify the ideal woman with her inner sensibility, which was the capacity to suffer. Right? So you had men who performed women who suffered. Suffered in terms of being uh, helpless women, widows, uh, you know, child widows, uh, women who had been ill-treated or abused by their families and parents were strapped in uh, uh, bad marriages um, uh, and so on and so forth. So it was the performance of women, of femininity, uh, as 
in an image of bourgeois respectability and modesty which enabled the mobility of women as social actors. So women, even when women actually began to perform on stage much later, they also had to in some sense suppress their sexuality and uh, perform a certain uh, degree of femininity which was modest and respectable and that in some sense became their uh, attempt to, uh, to uh, traverse uh, social uh, spaces and class, class issues. Parsi theatrical companies traveled widely. Right? I mean, they were not just restricted to Bombay, but they also traveled to Ceylon, Calcutta, Rangoon, Peshawar, and Sindh. Right? And um, many of the writers and actors, company managers, musicians, and stagehands belong to a mix of class and caste and religious backgrounds. The audiences were also equally mixed, initially of British officials, but then military and then wealthy Parsi merchants soon joined, uh, along with a growing class of educated professionals. There were textile workers, artisans and small traders who formed a large share of the audience by the end of the 19th century, accommodated by low ticket prices that ensured a heterogeneous public. The overwhelming majority of the early productions of Parsi plays, as I mentioned earlier, were in Gujarati, Urdu and Hindi. In addition to these plays, uh, you also had indigenous poetry and song genres, song material uh, taken primarily from Indian and Persian literary traditions. It's important to note that Parsi theatre employed both female impersonators and actresses for a considerable duration. Right? And both these female impersonators as well as the Jewish and Anglo-Indian actresses who played women on stage competed with each other for, for commercial attention. So there were two significant frames which uh, determined uh, the choice of, of, of a female impersonator or a Anglo-Indian or Jewish actress. One significant frame or sight was the gendered performer's body, the medium through which the performer addressed the public. By the process of refashioning and reworking its appearance, the body was converted into a usable construct for visual pleasure, gender identification and social meaning. And to a large extent, this process was within the realm of the performer's choice, guided and limited by audience desire and the performer's own capabilities. Another frame was the offstage arena of public debate, theatrical discourse, and company policy. Here, the image of the performer was constructed by social actors who had a stake in the theater's larger claims to cultural authority and prestige. Meanings were mapped onto the performer's body beyond his or her power to control. So the point that I think Hansen is trying to make here is that there were two frames, two sides that determined the choice of whether uh, a, a, female, a male impersonator or a, uh, a woman actress, female actress performs a female role on stage. One of course is the meanings attached to the body, the embodied actor on stage in terms of visual pleasure, in terms of gender identification and social meaning and to the larger and the other frame or the other site were the, was the larger uh, network of, um, of actors, theatrical production houses uh, and debates, public debates and company policy right? which, uh, which also had to then make a decision on whether to employ uh, uh, a female impersonator or uh, a female actress on stage. We have few uh, existing uh, accounts of these early male actors who played women, one of which is the Hindi monograph of Somnath Gupta, which was translated by Catherine Hansen in 1981, uh, which is heavily based on the theatre choices, notices of one-time actor and photographer Dhanji Bhai Patel. And the other source is the uh, Hindi doctoral dissertation of Vidyavati Namra, published in 1972, who was herself the daughter of the Parsi Hindi playwright Narayan Prasad Betab and the Hindi memoirs of Fida Hussain, the veteran actor of the Parsi stage, edited by Pratibha Agarwal in 1986. All these uh, early accounts of uh, uh, autobiographical accounts of these female uh, impersonators um, suggest uh, that uh, they were uh, in some sense uh, very, very necessary for the survival of Parsi theatre at the time.
uh, in fact, that uh, Dadi Patel, whom I mentioned earlier, was the leading female impersonator in his own uh, company, uh, the Victoria Theatrical Company. And uh, later on, when he broke away from the Victoria Theatrical Company to form his own, the original Victoria Theatrical Company, he took away all his, the most famous female impersonators, leaving the original company at a loss. Right? So female impersonators were very important, commercially very important for the time and for the success of plays. So you also had, for example, other plays that I mentioned earlier, for example, Rustam and Saurabh or Sone Ke Mool Ki Khurshid, right? uh, where uh, again, the important actor, Khurshid Baliwala, right? 1852 to 1913, again performed uh, female uh, and male roles. And many of these uh, female roles that, for example, Khurshid Baliwala performed uh, were uh, roles like Saheli or Sakhi. Right. He performed the companions of the heroine, which were a favored or familiar uh, role that many of the early uh, female, uh, male actors played as women or as young girls. So female impersonators performed various types of stage roles. One was the romantic heroine, beloved of the hero, and the embodiment of feminine perfection and modesty. So it was important for these uh, young male actors to have uh, melodious voices and a fine figure to uh, be convincing and successful uh, female impersonators. Female impersonation in Parsi theatre continued well into the, in, into the 20th century, retaining its popularity with audiences and company managers. Uh, there are not many, uh, again, documented accounts of, uh, of um, these female impersonators. What we do have is uh, incomplete is uh, the lives of uh, two non-Parsi actors, Jai Shankar Sundari, 1888 to 1967 from the Gujarati stage and the famous Bal Gandharva from the Marathi Musical Theatre, 1889 to 1975. Both of them, Sundari as well as Bal Gandharva, were, ex were excelled in the embodiment of feminine sensibility and decorum. And they were the ones who actually created, created prototypes, prototypes for the ideal Indian woman. Sundari launched his career on the Gujarati stage at the age of 12, starring in Saubhagya Sundari as the role, in the role of the auspicious young wife that gave him his stage name. Before that, he was an apprentice uh, for three years in Calcutta with the Parsi Theatre Company of Dada Bhai Tunti. Um, his first important role was the Emerald Fairy in Amanat's Indar Sabha, and he starred in a number of other Urdu language plays. During his Calcutta training, Sundari perfected the distinctive feminine gait and stage entry that secured his fame as a modest yet alluring heroine. In fact, Sundari was so famous that many of the songs that he sang on stage were later on printed uh, on sarius. Sundari, of course, relied on a method of total identification with women, modeling specific roles on female acquaintances whom he had closely observed. His autobiography provides a rare self-reflective glimpse of the process of transformation from man to woman. And you can actually get this, uh, a sense of their, of their lives from Catherine Hansen's uh, translations of uh, these actors' autobiographies called The Stages of Life. Here in a paragraph, Sundari says, I saw a beautiful young girl emerging from myself whose shapely, intoxicating limbs oozed youthful exuberance, in whose form is the fragrance of woman's beauty, in whose eyes feminine feelings keep brimming, in whose gait is expressed the mannerism of a Gujaratin, who is not a man but a woman. I saw such a portrait in the mirror. Reflecting the difference, the mirror was saying, this is not Jay Shankar. It is a shy and proud Gujaratin. That graceful movement, that acting, that enchantment. A sweet shiver ran through my body's limbs. Momentarily, I thought that I was not a man. So you see that in the process of actually dressing himself up as a woman and looking at his own image in the mirror, uh, Sundari realizes that he is no longer a man, but a woman. Similarly, Bal Gandharva also became uh, very popular in Maharashtra as a singing actor, particularly among the students of the Deccan College, as well as the courts of several Indian princes. His debut was in the role of Shakuntala before the Prince of Miraj in 1905. Like Sundari, Bal Gandharva was, was also known for his tragic portrayals of female misfortune. And so therefore audiences completely loved 
his ability to actually emote uh, the tragedy of uh, his, hero, his heroines. Bal Gandharva, like Sundari, also set the standards and fashions for women's dresses and behavior, and his photographic image was used in commodities for the female consumption, especially cosmetics. He popularized sari styles, jewelry, such as the nose stud, the wearing of flowers in the hair, and carrying handkerchiefs. There were also photos of him in his roles as a middle-class housewife, uh, and so on and so forth. What is actually interesting is that uh, in some of the other plays that Bal Gandharva acted in, um, especially Man of Man, he enters the stage uh, looking rather with his hair set loose, uh, like the heroine who has not yet had her bath. And in another scene, he turns his back to the audience to reveal a long braid. So while these images might seem uh, lascivious or, sedu or seductive and alle alle alluring, uh, these gestures were, read, uh, were, were not read as crude, right? but were understood as modest and charming representations of the educated young women of the day. So many of his songs were memorable for their emotional expressivity. Uh, especially the projection of certain traditional sentiments of romance and, on, and pathos, Shringara and Karuna Rasa. His voice production also was somehow somewhere midway between male and female registers, like many of the other singer actors of his time. <laughs> 